There is one book that I'm bringing in. Now, you see the size of this. I don't know how many of you have the patience to read a book of this size, okay? This is a tremendous book. But it's called A World at Arms. The, um, the author is Gerhard Weinberg. This is the best, the best, the best book on World War II that you can find. It's not, as you can see, it's not a coffee table book. It is a book that if you're interested in World War II, if you felt some interest in it in your lifetime and you want to know exactly what happened, Gerhard Weinberg's book was expected for 20 years. The history community were waiting for him to come out with this book, which he did about 20 years ago. It is essentially a diplomatic history. It will tell you what was in Roosevelt's mind, and Churchill's mind, and Stalin's mind, and Hitler's mind, and so on and so forth. And it is absolutely, I read it from cover to cover, and it was for me a page turner. I can't imagine a book of this size. I'm going to pass it around. And some of the material that I am going to talk about today, which I will guarantee will surprise you, is coming out of the material I got out of this book. Okay? So Bob is already uh, here, and you can go around, and you particularly want you to notice how many notes he's got to make sure that you're sure he's telling you the real facts. He has a tremendous number of notes. Okay, now, um, let me see a couple of other books. This book I think I mentioned before, Adam Ulam's book on the um, history of foreign policy of Soviet Union. This is also an interesting book by Francois Fouré. Fouré is uh, gone now, but he was a, a French expert on the French Revolution. And because he was an expert on the revolution, his main focus in this book, The Passing of Illusion, is on the aspect of revolution and the role it played in the Soviet Union. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Fouré sees parallels between the fascist movement and the communist movement, particularly around the subject of revolution. Now, today we're going to be talking about World War II. But you can't understand World War II without taking account of World War I. Everything that we're going to come up with today is focused around how the Western countries and how the Soviet Union reacted to World War I and what it meant. The main thing that you can find and what it meant is the blood, the amount of people killed. So many died in France, so many died in Germany, so many died in England. They were totally blown away by the amount of bloodshed in that war. And so when we come to this period, we should understand what it was that they were thinking about, their unwillingness to go ahead, their appeasement of Hitler, their fright about whether there would be another war. And that's what's going to play. Very important for the Soviet Union was the fear which occurred at the time of the revolution that they could not maintain their communist government unless there was a, a revolutions in the West, that the, the revolution of 1917 in Russia would spark revolutions throughout Western Europe. That was Lenin's dream. It did not happen. And so as we saw in the last lecture, in the struggle between Stalin and Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Trotsky, the question was, where do we stand? Do we have to uh, stimulate revolutions? And Stalin's uh, motto, it wasn't as clear in the struggle because there were many other factors that I have mentioned, but one of the mottos that Stalin used was socialism in one country. Now we've seen Stalin succeed. We've seen him come from the outlaw Koba in the Caucasus through the operator in the revolution, through the civil war and his effects there, and his struggle for power. And last lecture, we saw the bloody uh, result of his ascendancy to power 
in killing of his Bolsheviks comrades and the famine in the Ukraine. And now he comes out of Russia, hands bloody with all that we saw, the 20 million dead, and strides onto the world stage. And we're going to see now what happens, and you all know the story, but let's look at the detail as this uh, figure, Stalin, enters into the world stage of the 1930s. And it's so apropos, Engel's remarks are absolutely apropos for what we're about to look at. And, it's, and true, too, of Bukharin. OK, one look at this is just a side look. He loved to play shoot pool. I remember when I was a kid, I used to shoot pool in, uh, in the neighborhood that I lived in Brownsville. And this is his pool table. What knocked me out about this was, he doesn't have one of those pool tables that, where the balls shoot down and come down at the bottom, which we had in, in the pool room that I used to hang out in. He, no, it's a, they say billiards, but it's pocket billiards. You see the little pockets around it, yeah. So I thought this was a real down. I thought this was, a, why didn't he have the best and the greatest? But someone pointed out to me, if you really want to have a fine pool table, this is the kind you should have without that thing that rolls down, which I guess shakes up the pool table and destroys its perfect balance. And this is a picture of his uh, DACA. This is where he died. And um, this is the near DACA right outside of Moscow. OK, so let's look at the foreign policy at the time. He, um, in the Soviet Union, what they were mostly afraid of was that the capitalist countries would unite, that England, France, Germany, Italy, all the capitalist powers would encircle them, and they would be crushed by a unity of uh, enemies. And so they were trying to keep out of, the, out of entanglements between these capitalist powers and also prevent them from uniting with each other if they possibly could. That was the main thrust of their foreign policy, so that they could pursue, that uh, Stalin could pursue socialism in a single country. Now, uh, let's look at that slogan for a minute. Socialism in a single country, that would mean it's not workers of the world unite. That was Marx. That was Lenin. Workers of the world, everybody get together. Now it's socialism in a single country. If you're a communist in Italy, if you're a communist in France, we're not telling you to spark a revolution anymore. We're telling you to help the workers' paradise. Just do whatever you can to help us in Russia. Just do whatever you can, and we'll tell you what to do. So it becomes more nationalistic than the original workers of the world unite. And what was Hitler's party's name? The National Socialists. So there's a unity between these two powers. Nationalism is playing a role. National socialism and socialism in a single country. And also, he, he had this phrase, Stalin had this phrase, don't pull the chestnuts out of the fire. So let's have relations with them, but let's uh, uh, stay back of them. Now, they, they thought that the Nazis would be, um, uh, might come to power, but that the Nazis would uh, eventually, that they would turn to Bolshevism. Um, to give you some idea of what was going on, if, if you can get some lights on this and get the camera on this, these are the election results for 1930 and 1932 in Germany, OK? In 1930, the Social Democrats and the Communists, between them, 143 for the Social Democrats and 77 for the Communists. That's, uh, what is that? That's 213. That's 220 votes. Votes. Vote. Votes. The Nazis, 107. So that these two in 1930 are the majority. But by 1932, the Nazis poll 230. And the Social Democrats and the Communists are less than they are. OK? Now, in that period, 
Stalin and the, so and the communists label for social democrats, get this, was social fascists. They called them the social fascists. They would not unite with them. They considered them enemies because the social democrats were a bourgeois party that was trying to get the same elements of the society that they, the communists, were going for. And so they would never cooperate with the social democrats. And this might have changed matters. If they had operated together, they might have kept Hitler from getting into the majority position that he, that he got. Now, in 1934, at the time of the Reichstag fire, when Hitler was then made chancellor, the communists became frightened of them and instituted the Popular Front. And if that was a switch, they no longer called the Social Democrats the Social Fascists, and they were ready to unite with them. The threat, they had two threats, uh, one from Japan and one from West Germany. Remember, Japan had defeated the Tsarist regime in 1909, and they represented a very, very real threat to the Soviet Union. And they were trying to avoid getting involved and getting involved that might draw them into war. They were very frightened of war. Armaments production at a high priority, and that was part of that second five-year plan, part of that Stockenite movement that we saw that young woman who talked to the cement worker the last time in the video. And they, they uh, developed non-aggression pacts. It's interesting. Their non-aggression pact with France was negotiated by <coughs> Pierre Laval. Pierre Laval was the prime the premier of the Vichy government during the Second World War. Uh, Soviet, uh, th this we're, talk we're talking about the Spanish Civil War at this point. Okay, now the Spanish Civil War breaks out in '36. Um, at first, Stalin is, doesn't want to get involved with this because it might involve him with a war in Europe. But finally, he uh, agrees on um, participation, but the participation is never like the German and Italian participation. There are never Sov uh, Soviet Russian soldiers there. There are volunteers. You might remember, too, that in the Korean War, when Mao sent his troops in, they were called volunteers. But anyway, he sends in so-called volunteers from all over the world, including communists and sympathizers from America in the Lincoln Brigade. Uh, he was afraid of Trotskyites. He was afraid of Trotsky getting power. Remember, in the Soviet Union, the revolution of 1917 was carried out by a very small party. The Bolsheviks were a tiny little party. And so he was afraid that the Trotsky uh, movement would gain a foothold, will have a state to sponsor them, and become a threat to him. And so NKVD agents were sent into the, uh, Spain during this time, and murders were carried out to kill Trotskyites. At the time, they were fighting Franco. Uh, he pulls the communists out of the government in 1938. And by 1939, Franco is victorious. And those citizens who went to Spain to fight on the side of the Republican government, many of them were executed and persecuted uh, when they returned because they were feared by Stalin to be infected with the Trotskyite germ all part of the purges and the, and the fear that he had of um, internal dissent and uh, external dissent. Here are the um, uh, International Brigade coming over the Pyrenees. Uh, they're coming into France. There's a French uh, policeman leading them over, and the war is over, and they've been defeated. Trotsky, it was called Trotsky's Opportunity to Spread Revolution, and uh, Stalin looked upon it as, uh, I don't have the kind of uh, resources that I can expend on a Spanish Civil War. So it was very limited, uh, but there was some support coming from him. At the same time, I should remind you all that Churchill's 
sympathies were definitely with Franco, and he stated it openly at the time and in his memoirs. This was what was going on in China. This is also really interesting. Mao was suppressed by the Kuomintang. He was almost killed in Shanghai by the Kuomintang when Chiang turned on the communists who were then his allies. He and uh, Chu Enlai had to practically jump out of a window to get away from them. And then they organized the so-called Long March, where all the followers went up to northwest China. In 1931, the Japanese were in, in China and fighting against uh, Chiang and the communists. Now, Mao was ordered to conduct a um, united front with uh, Chiang, but Chiang was not interested in that. Chiang wanted to get Mao and wanted to suppress him or kill him. And he had a, uh, uh, a general up in uh, Manchuria who was resisting his entreaties to get a uh, turn on uh, Mao. So Chiang uh, made a trip to Manchuria. And when he got there, this general seized him. And Mao came over there, and uh, Chu Enlai came over there. And Chiang was now a captive of Mao and Chu Enlai. And they could have eliminated him at the time. But Stalin said no. If Chang agrees to fight the Japanese, we will let him continue. And that's exactly what they did. And the reason they did that was because they were so afraid, that is the Soviets, were so afraid of the Japanese. They were, wanted Japan to be occupied by a war with the Chinese nationalists and not be focused on Russia or the Soviet Union. They were still thinking about 1905 and a fear of Japanese incursions into um, their country. Here they are, the two handsome fellows. That's uh, Chu on the outside of the building, and that's uh, young Mao uh, standing inside. That would be 1937, up in the northwest after the Long March. They almost look like nice guys. OK, now in 37, Japan turns into China, and uh, Stalin is pledging to help them. And there's an army in Manchukuo, which is uh, the Japanese uh, name for uh, Manchuria. And there's a clash. You know, we didn't even even know about this. There was, it says 18,000 additional soldiers. There was something like 50,000 soldiers involved in this fighting along the border. Not a minor skirmish, you will have to admit. And the general in charge was uh, Zhukov. Zhukov, because of his exploits and because of his victory here, he pushes them back. Um, he attains a stature and is later a um, commanding general in the war against the uh, German fascists. But you can see that this was a major, major fight. And you can understand the concern that the Soviets had with respect to Japan. This is all going on while the uh, fascist menace is building up uh, in Europe. Now, how to respond to uh, Hitler? Um, as I told you, they called the Social Democrats the social fascists. But once the Reichstag fire occurs, they reorient and they return to, they turn to the Popular Front, that is, the Soviets return to a policy uh, known as the Popular Fronts, which is cooperation with the so Social Democrats. Mutual assistance pacts are, are written with France and with uh, Czechoslovakia. This will play a role in the run-up to the war because, of course, at Munich, Czechoslovakia is sold out by Britain and France. Uh, part of this uh, agreement with the French would be military convention. That is to say, to set down in detail how each country will help the other. But the French hold back. All they have is a treaty on paper that says that were one attacked by the other, well, one were attacked by Germany, the other one won't, quote, help Germany. That was the extent of the pact. But they do have some uh, preambles which say that they're going to help each other. 
1935, we have the United Front or the Popular Front. In 1936, 1937, there is um, a very strong fascist movement in France. The Cross of Fire, it's, it's called. Um, and um, there is a, it's, it's quite powerful. So what's Stalin's game in this part of this time? Uh, there's not going to be any revolutions, as I said before. He's trying to build up the army, production of arms and so on. He has his spies all over the world. He has an intelligence agency. But above all, who is he trusting? As usual, himself. He doesn't trust anybody. And this leads him into some grave mistakes. <clears throat> but this is the way uh, he is. Uh, to give you an idea of the servile uh, commissars at this time, um, they call themselves young representatives of a healthy young people. Stalin is up at the platform. There's applause. And now Stalin speaks. He mispronounces in the speech the word for the agricultural commissariat. It should be said, it should be pronounced narcom narcomzim. Instead, he says narcomzium. He mispronounces it. Every speaker that follows him mispronounces it exactly the same way. Well, everybody is scared of him, you know. Nobody wants to insult him. And that's the kind of power he had at that point. After killing everybody, you can imagine uh, why. <clears throat> now, the military policy. They don't want to provoke any, any trouble, so the uh, forts are put f back from the border, away from the border. Uh, don't plan for a defensive war. That's equivalent to treason. Uh, they're called a, a stab in the back. And someone who uh, uh, reported German uh, technological advances accurately is arrested and executed. If you behave like this, you're not going to get good information. And this is what he begins to encourage. He's not getting, he's not going to get good information. On the other side, I just want to keep this in mind. On the other side, in, in Hitler's world, they, if you remember, I don't know if you remember that, but to go back to World War I, the Allied forces never crossed into Germany in World War I. All of the fighting was in France. So this is a country, Germany, that lost the war, but they were never in their country. And they became a, um, a reason for this. You had to have a reason for this. Also, um, people in Germany and in France, this was the, the underlying foundation of the fascist movement, what was all this blood all about? Why was, why was so many killed and so many wounded? What was the reason for it? Who ordered it? Why did it happen? And the answer from the fascists, it happened for the country, for nationalism, for La France, for the Volk, for Germany, for France, for England. Whatever country you were in, that was the reason for it. And it was the veterans that were the rock of um, the French fascists and the rock of Hitler's fa uh, Nazi party and the rock of Mussolini's fascism were veterans. Veterans were the underlying um, political strength of those movements. German policy. They were condoned, they were, uh, if they went east, if they went toward Russia, that was okay with UK and France. And that was really what the Soviet Union was afraid of. One of Hitler's, uh, uh, one of Hitler's theories about why they lost, and it was very common, common in Germany, was the stab in the back theory. We were stabbed in the back. We were winning on the front, though. We could have won on the front. There was a massive um, uh, offensive just before the armistice of November. We would have won if we weren't stabbed in the back. And the then premier of the German uh, Weimar Republic at the time was uh, Rathenau, who happened to be a Jew. 
The other thing that they uh, were afraid of or, the, or that they uh, focused on was the fact that there were bread shortages during the war. And the Ukraine beckoned to Hitler as the answer. Lieberstrom, if we got the Ukraine, if we got this vast bread basket, we would have sufficient resources, we would have sufficient um, supplies to be immune to a problem as we had. Everybody fights the last war. So that was the concept, that we wouldn't have the same kind of, of um, civilian uh, discontent as we had during the World War I if we only had that part of the world. At this point, uh, the Soviet Union offers uh, assistance to Czechoslovakia before the Munich uh, of March 1939, but the Czechs did not want the Soviets on their soil. And more importantly than that, in order for the Soviets to uh, to help Czechoslovakia, they would have to come across Poland, and Poland didn't want them. Uh, in 1937, with all the purges that went on, Tukhachevsky, the famous general that uh, had brought the Red Army up to the gates of Warsaw, he was executed. Uh, at, at that time, Litvinov, who Litvinov survived all the purges miraculously. As I told you the last time, he slept with a pistol under his pillow. Uh, he managed to survive all, and I'll explain why he survived. Um, he advocated collective security, which they did not pick up on. Romanians and Poles were unwilling to permit, and I, I, in a way I couldn't blame them. Now that we know what we know about the Red Army, you can't blame them for being frightened of this. So uh, Stalin is being um, unsure if he can maintain this game that he's playing. He's not sure if he can keep this up. Okay? So what happens next? <clears throat> Soviet offers to consult with the Czechoslovakia. The Brits say no. The Poles say no. The USSR is ready to stand by. But Britain and France are not showing interest in collective security. And they go to Munich without the Soviet Union. So what does this look like to them? They go to Munich and they make an agreement with Germany. So this looks to them, who have been afraid all the time that the capitalist countries will unite and snuff them out, England and France agree with Germany, and they are going to turn their guns on us. That's their fear now. It's not working. They're going to make war on us like they always wanted to, and they're going to end our revolution once and for all. So when Stalin turns to Hitler, it's not as surprising or it's not as much of a stab in the back as we all think it is. From their point of view, this last bullet down there is the stab in the back. Now, they're counting on a war. What, what, um, this, is the, this is the magazine. I don't know if the guys down in South County can see this. This is a magazine from March 11th. 1940, when war breaks out between uh, Germany and uh, France, they're counting on this guy. This is a French soldier, all right? Let me read you, to you what uh, the, um, yeah, that, it's on my slide, right. This is what they say in there. He's practically unbeatable on his home ground. Stalin is looking forward to a repeat of World War I. Trench warfare, Germany and France murder each other in an interminable fight as they did in World War I. And this guy is going to see that that happens. Chamberlain declares French and British support if Poland were attacked. He wants the Soviet Union to support the pledge. But Stalin is not buying it. Anyway, Poland hate, the Poles hate the Russians, and the Russians hate the Poles, so that's the given. 
Okay? And as I say, Polish Soviet enmity. You'll see later on in these slides when the Red Army finally is defeating the uh, fascists, the German fascists, they come up to the gates of Warsaw. In 1920, they came up to the gates of Warsaw and they wanted to be let in, but the Poles pushed them all the way back, all the way back into Russia. Now this time in World War II, they're going to come up to the same gates and the Poles are going to say, come in and help us. And the Russians are going to sit there for a week and a half while the Nazis wipe them out. Polish Soviet enmity. So that what's the Stalin's game plan? The world communism movement's weak. He's going to make all the decisions. And he wants them admired in a long war. He wants to repeat a World War I. He wants to keep out of it. And when it's all over, it won't be a revolution in Petersburg. It'll be a revolution in Berlin, in Budapest, in Paris, and maybe in London. That's his game, 1939. And in a way, now that you look at it and you think about it, you know, it might be, it might look pretty good. It might look like a game that you could play. So how to avoid war? The USSR is ready for war, he says, he thinks. Turns out that he's not. There's no reason why she, why she should not live with us on a normal footing. I mean, I just want to give you an idea of Hitler's idea about the Bolsheviks before we go into the war itself. Hitler made these remarks. He said, uh, it's not Germany that will turn Bolsheviks, will turn Bolshevik, but Bolshevism, this is Hitler's words, but Bol Bolshevism that will become a sort of national socialism. Besides, there is more than that binds us to Bolshevism than separates us from it. There is above all genuine revolutionary f feeling which is alive everywhere in Russia except where there are Jewish Marxists. I have always made allowance for this circumstance and given orders that communists are to be admitted to the party at once. That was Hitler. That was Hitler. Communists are to be admitted to the party at once. And I don't know, 19... Uh, 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 he made this in, 19, in the spring of 1934, just around the time of the Reichstag fire. Okay? Um, the war is about to break out. One of the things, I invite you all to come up here and look through this magazine. Um, somewhere they had a guy named Samuel er Elliot Morrison. There's some good pictures of Hitler, too, in here, um, who analyzed the coming war. And I'll uh, see if I can find Well, I can't find it now. It'll take up too much time. But you can thumb through this and find it. And you can see all the baloney that he puts out, how the Germans are going to be, how the French are going to beat the Germans. And so, so everything he says is wrong, but he's an expert, Colonel uh, Samuel L Elliott Morrison. OK. So he's ready to make a pact with the communists. And that's why, I'll be with you in a second, that's why Litvinov is removed as foreign minister because, unfortunately, Litvinov is Jewish. So Litvinov is removed as foreign minister and Molotov takes over as foreign minister. Yes? I, you know, you touched very briefly on the fact that he had this encounter with the Japanese in Manchuria. Yeah. The, the Japanese Manchurian army was being built up by the Japanese for the express purpose of launching an attack against the Soviet Union. Yeah. They had a substantial army on the border and was very significant, and the Soviets were deathly afraid of it. They were. Just this one encounter? Well, no, there were many encounters. That was, like the, that was the biggest one, uh, and this occurred even after Chiang had united with Mao to continue fighting them. So it was a constant sore 
for the, uh, for the Soviet planners that the Japanese were there ready to come in. And they had made overtures to the Americans to try and uh, ameliorate the situation. But the Americans were too um, isolationist-minded to get wrapped up in this. Of course, the Americans had helped settle the 1909 Russo-Japanese War, but they were not interested in this, in this matter. OK, so Litvinov's replaced by Molotov. And now we're going to, in May 1939, we're getting on to the war now. They think they're going to be out of it. We're going to engage in negotiations with the Soviet Union. So they haven't yet signed anything, but Hitler it tells his generals to get ready to invade Poland. Ribbentrop advocates an agreement, and he feels, they feel, that if they got this from the German point of view, if they got an agreement with the Russians, that England and France would be afraid to get involved in the fight. And so they could snap up Poland and then turn to uh, whoever they're going to turn to next as their next enemy. And uh, my belief is that they had their eyes on the Russians all the time. And they did not expect to be fighting Britain and France. They did not want to fight Britain and France. You might remember Rudolf Hess made a, uh, a flight to England in the hopes that he could bring an end to the fight between uh, Germany and England so that they all could turn on the Soviet Union. So the fears the Soviet Union had about the capitalist world encircling them and, uh, and fighting them was realistic. The USSR conducts negotiations with both the West and with Germany. But uh, England sends uh, admirals Sir Reginald Plunkett, Earl, Earl Drax. Why, why do these guys have all these names? They have a 400 last names toward a military agreement. This is a secondary figure in the British government. But the Germans send Ribbentrop, their minister. Stalin concludes that if Germany struck Poland and France would go to war, and that's exactly what he wants, as I explained before. The Wehrmacht could not wait, and so all this dicking around and Stalin being careful and so on, they send him a message. Hitler sends him a personal telegram, here's Stalin, and either, you know, put your sign now. I don't want to use the phrase that we all use. So two hours of receiving this ultimatum, Stalin agrees, and the Stalin-Hitler pact is made. 1939. And here are some photographs. Uh, here you are, August 24th. Now, I took the date out so you could all see the date very clearly. Keep these dates in mind. They're very important to this story. German, Germany and Russia sign a 10-year non-aggression pact, binding each other not to aid opponents, etc., etc. That's August 24th. That's just before the end of August, OK? 24th of August, 1939. And there they are signing. There's Molotov as minister at the table. Right behind him is Vlasic. That's the personal uh, major domo of Stalin, the guy who wasn't there when Stalin died that time because he had been in jail for corruption. Standing next to Vlasic is Ribbentrop. Uh, of course, there's Stalin, and there's an interpreter standing next to Stalin. And they're all very happy. Stalin's really happy about it. Happy, happy. And his really happy is Adolf, OK? And he's talking to Ribbentrop and the rest of his entourage. OK, so we're ready to go. That's the 24th of August. Now, the 1st of September, how many days have passed now? That's about seven days, I think. Seven days later, one week later, the German army attacks Poland. Cities bombed. Danzig accepted into the Reich. And there's a little um, map showing how they're going, and so on and so forth. September 3rd, two days later, we're only two more days, Britain and France are at war. Hitler won't halt the attack. And uh, we're now in Sunday, September 3rd, 1939. And um, Germany is now at war with France and England. OK? And that's exactly what Hitler 
what uh, Stalin was hoping for. Now, just look at this. This is another, uh, that was the 3rd of September. This is the 17th. This is two weeks later. Soviet troops. Now the Soviets come in. They're coming in to claim their piece of Poland. First, the Germans come in on the 1st, and then the Soviets come in on the 17th. Okay? So Poland is being uh, attacked from both sides. Now, look at this map. Look carefully at this map. Here you have Grodno. They took all the way from their border near Minsk up to Grodno. They take Riga, they take Talinin, they take Lvov, they take uh, Kishinev down here. This, just keep, bear these, these uh, uh, in mind. Now, I don't know if you can read these little boxes, but it says, Latvia, before 1914, it was Russian. Lithuania, before 1914, it was Russian. Eastern Ang Anglica was Austrian. Eastern Poland, Russian, before 1914. What this all tells you is that this was the czarist regime's part of Europe. Okay? Now look at this. I showed you this map three or four weeks ago when I, to when I showed you how the Poles pushed the Red Army back from Warsaw, pushed them all the way into Russia, and finally reached the agreement, the Treaty of Riga. The, the Poles pushed all the way up to here. But at the Treaty of Riga, agreed to this line, which included all of these parts of Tsarist Russia. And so the Reds lost all of this Russian land to the Poles. But here in 1939, it all comes back. Okay? But I want you to bear this in mind. When people say that he grabbed a piece of Poland, from Stalin's point of view, he didn't grab a piece of Poland. He grabbed back a piece of Russia that he, he Stalin, and this is what I think is very important. In 1920s, what happened in 1920s, Tukhachevsky was up here and calling for the two armies to unite. And Stalin was down here with this army, refusing to pull the two armies together so that when they got to Warsaw, they could not break in. Of course, they were planning on a workers of the world uniting and a whole revolution starting when the, when the Red Army arrived, which wasn't going to happen. Okay, so here we are in 1939, and they've annexed what they their old uh, Russian lands back again, plus some other pieces. Hey Stan, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, you say they were Russian territory before the First World War. Yes. Did they have a national tradition? Oh, definitely, particularly Lithuania. Lithuania in medieval days, or even after medieval days, ex uh, controlled all of Poland and uh, the Ukraine. It was a tremendous country. Um, these, these parts of the world swing back and forth, so you never know who's in charge at any one time. But I, the reason I, I focus on this is because I believe it was Stalin's personal um, shame for, because he was upbraided for this at, in the Civil War. He was called to Moscow, and he was asked why he didn't obey orders to unite with Tukhachevsky. And I think this was all part of the score that he kept in his personal account book. And as I told you, Tukhachevsky was eliminated in the purge. So the, the Russians start their invasion of Poland, of Finland. Okay, now, I just want to go back on the dates one more time now. What, where were we with this? September 17th. We're at the 17th of September, and we're talking about Poland. So we go from the 17th of September to November 30th. That's about a month and a half, about six weeks forward, right? And what are they doing now? Now they're going into Finland. So up they go into Finland to settle some scores up there. And they send um, Voroshilov. Voros Klemt Voroshilov comes out of the um, Caucasus. He's one of us. Uh, he's there right now. Uh, he's one of. Um, yeah. He's one of, uh, of uh, Stalin's old Caucasus buddies. 
And he's got this job because of his loyalty and their old relationship. He's the general. Uh, he rode with, uh, with Boudini during the Civil War, and um, he's a Cossack kind of guy. But they make a mess of it. They don't beat the Finns. The Finns are tough as nails. And so this great Soviet Red Army ends up with egg on his face. And Voroshilov is not giving any more commands after this. Okay, there's this guy again. What's going on in France and England, uh, France and uh, Germany at this point? It's called the phony war. Nothing. Nothing happened. They're at war and they sit there. And it was referred to as the phony war from September 3rd, 1939 to the middle of 1940, June 1940, nothing goes on. This guy sits behind the Maginot Line, and the Germans sit in there on their side of the defense, and nothing is going on. The Nazis, um, okay, we get this, now we're getting up to the war. Okay, so, the phony war is going on. They've taken in Poland. They're fighting in Finland, and in Finland it's not going very well. And there's a, a perception in Germany that the Soviet army is um, weak. The perception is growing that the Soviet Red Army can't really do the job. And that if they wait, they begin to see that, wait a minute, these guys are not up to it. If crummy little Finland can resist them, they're not up to it. This is the time to strike. Why are we waiting for them to get stronger? This is where we wanted to go in the first place. And that's another reason for the phony war. Hitler is presented with a number of plans for how to win against France. And one of the most unlikely is the one he chooses. Now, we'd have to uh, hate to admire Hitler, but we have to respect the Manstein plan. He had many other options, but he chooses the Manstein plan. The Manstein plan was to send tanks through the Ardennes forest. Now, tanks are for the open country. They're not for the Ardennes forest. But Manstein reasoned that he could get the tanks through. And that's the plan that Hitler adopts. On the French side, they assume that no tanks can come through the Ardennes. They have the Maginot Line, which runs across the north of France up to Belgium. And then there's the Ardennes Forest. And they are uniting with the English. The English send an expeditionary force in over the channel. They're set up on the channel uh, end of that line. And in the middle is the Ardennes Forest. And defending the French end of the far Ardennes Forest are their weakest divisions, older troops who are uh, beyond the age. And their tanks are down near Paris. They have excellent tanks, but they're down near Paris in a depot. And if they had to get up to this front, they have to be loaded on trains and brought up. And one of the advocates of bringing up uh, tanks uh, to the front, but is resisted by the military who don't, at this point, don't really appreciate the value of tanks, is de Gaulle, a young uh, officer advocating tank warfare. Okay, this is the picture. The Nazis at the Channel, they trap the Allies in Belgium. They cross the river, 60 miles. They come through the Ardennes splitting the line between the French and the English expeditionary forces. The English are stuck up there. I don't know if you can see it on this map. This is Dunkirk, this little town here. Can you see it? Does it come up? OK. And that's where they're going to get out. But they can no longer keep up the fight that they were preparing for. The old trench warfare idea and the concept that Stalin was counting on is fading away. I think I have another map. And this is May 22nd, 1940. OK, this is a closer map. This shows you um, Dunkirk here. Um, the tanks are coming through. This is the Ardennes area. Uh, this is where they break through. 
and the two uh, ends of the line are broken. They actually are going around the vaunted Maginot Line. And in this uh, magazine, there's a lot in here about the invincible Maginot Line, all the baloney that we read. Uh, when we read these pundits, it's amazing. I remember in the in the first Iraq war, reading about pundits, how Saddam Hussein was going to resist the uh, thrust of the Allied army and so on and so forth. So my, I'm very skeptical of all punditry, as you can tell. And I guess you, most of you are as well. OK. Does anybody know what this picture is? I'll give you a hint. Well, yeah, I'll give you a hint. These guys are Mexican police. It's Trotsky. That's the weapon that killed Trotsky. May, August 20th, 1940. The Mexican police, I mean, in case those of you who don't know what happened, a agent of uh, Stalin uh, wormed his way into uh, the entourage around Trotsky, who was that time living in the San Angel area, a suburb of Mexico City, and came up behind him while he was at his desk and smacked him in the head with this weapon and killed him. And so finally, the last purge, well, not the last, but the one purge victim that Stalin was after uh, was finally settled. OK, Stalin's appeasement. He hopes to keep out of the war, as I told you. In fact, in 1940, Molotov approaches the, the Nazis with the idea that they would join the Axis. It's hard to believe that, but the Nazis weren't ready for him. They don't reply to it. They'll sign trade agreements, but they won't sign a political agreement. <coughs> the Finnish campaign, as I told you, went badly. The French. This guy had not lived up to expectations. The USSR needed more time. They're trying to build up. He doesn't want to give Hitler a chance to start a war with him. And they are propaganda during the Hitler-Stalin pact was that Germany wants peace. Let's, and that was the communist line at the time. But Hitler was looking at this. They did a lousy job in Finland. They're not so strong right now. And let's go. This is where we wanted to go all the time. He had a fairly good intelligence service. Richard Sorge, his agent in Japan, found out about the attack. He told them about the attack. He sent back um, reports. The intelligence officers in the, military, in the Soviet military heard about it. Schulenberg, who is the German ambassador, not a Nazi, but a German uh, diplomat, he told Stalin, Hitler might strike you in the future. Uh, they want to go on military alert. Stalin's afraid of a provocation. So he refuses to allow them to go on military alert. We're getting to June 41, OK? June 41. So here's another date, June 22nd, 1941. That's six months after the lousy campaign in Finland. They made a deal with Finland, and Finland gave them a couple of islands and a little bit of territory, and they came to a settlement with Finland. Now, six months later, Hitler begins his war, and into Russia he goes. OK, so now he's following Napoleon into Russia, and he's going to get the same result. You know, the biggest uh, uh, defense in Russia is space. You know, he's got to cover all this space. So let's see what happens. General Zhukov calls him on the phone. Do you understand me, Comrade Stalin? Stalin goes into a state of shock. So what date did they go in? Wait a minute. June 22nd, 1941. And Stalin addresses his people on July 3rd? So how many days is that? That's about 14 days, am I right? What's with Stalin? His country's invaded. He doesn't get on the radio. Molotov gets on the radio to say that there's an invasion. He goes into a depression. He doesn't come out of that fancy DACA that you saw in the previous slide. 
they go out there, the, the Politburo goes out there to see him, and he thinks they're coming to arrest him. Can you believe it? Yeah. Why did Germany at this time turn on, turn on Stalin? They felt that if they let him alone, he would build up too high. They felt that this is the time to go when he's shown that his Red Army can't beat little Finland and that the longer they wait, the longer his armaments will build. And they felt this was the time to go. And they wanted to go, actually, they wanted to go in May, but they got wrapped up in Yugoslavia and that slowed them down. They could not beat the Yugoslavs fast enough. And by the fact that they went in July, they're going to end up in front of Moscow in the middle of winter, which is not good. If they had gone, if they had beat the Yugoslavs earlier and had gone six weeks earlier, they would have gotten to, to Moscow in much better shape than they end up. But didn't they realize they were opening two fronts at the same time? I think after that, uh, June 40 uh, run and the English pulled out of Dunkirk and evacuated and they had pretty much defeated the French and they were now had occupied France. They were not fighting out there. They had an English island but they were hoping eventually that the English would come to reason and make peace with them. And so their plan, they did not fight on two fronts at this point. They were, had an enemy but they weren't fighting with the, fr with the English. Okay, so if militarily, if they could knock out, and they're going to come close to knocking out the Soviet Union. If you watch this story, as you probably know from your own information, uh, Medvedev disputes the account. Medvedev is the guy who wrote that book I had, Let History Judge, but I believe it. And then most of my sources say that this is exactly what happened. He goes into a funk. He thinks that they're coming to arrest him. Yes, Joe. Is he any kid to the president? No, no, it's just, it's a common, it's a common Russian name. Okay. Medvedev says, oh look, this is really interesting, right? This is what Medvedev says. Even before the Second World War, Soviet political writers frequently declared that just as in the First War had led to the victory of socialist revolution in Russia, the Second War would lead to the victory in most European and Asian countries. That was not empty talk. Real chances for victory of socialist revolution arose during the Second World War. It depended on the fortunes of the German-Soviet conflict. If it had been less successful for Hitler in 41, he would not have declared war in the United States. I don't agree with this, personally. The Red Army would have moved into Western Europe while Britain had not yet recovered from her defeats, and uh, so on and so forth. So that's his thinking, right? Medvedev is a communist who didn't like Stalin, felt that Stalin's incompetence made for the problem. Okay, look at what they do. They come in with 2,700 planes, three million soldiers, and 600,000 horses. He's coming in with 600, half a million horses, okay? 4,000 of the Soviet planes are destroyed. 600,000 soldiers are captured. Half of the country is occupied. And General Franz Hadler says they lost the war in the first eight days. And this is why they did it. This is what they expected. Uh, the Blitzkrieg, the shock troops, we will knock them out. And they come close to knocking them out. Here they go. There's a motorcycle coming out of the forest into Russia. And this is how far they push. Pushing all the way up. Whoa, whoa, there we go. And past Kharkov, past Kursk, past Oral, up to the gates of Moscow. In a very short time. Yeah. It's not up to the gates of Moscow, it's in Moscow. You have to go there and see just the point of last German advance. It is in the city. Isn't that amazing? And those who couldn't hear what Arthur said, it's in, the, it's actually, this front line is actually in the city as it now exists today. Okay, so they, they're pushing in, and as we said, it's a tremendous push. And here are the Russian prisoners. Look at this mass of prisoners. Autumn 1941. 
that's autumn. We, they started in June, and by autumn they are sweeping up. They, these are units that ask to be allowed to retreat, but uh, Stalin refuses them the, uh, the request, and so they have to stay in place and get encircled. Again, uh, Stalin's genius has failed him and failed and failed. Leningrad is surrounded. But Leningrad is surrounded but not captured. The big starvation occurs. It's a tremendous, terrible problem. What did the Nazis do with 600,000 uh, people? They are treated like dirt. Uh, some of them survive. Those who do survive to the end of the war are sent to Siberia because they're all suspect. They're all effect, infected by capitalist germs of some kind. Some of them join an army of, uh, of Russians who are fighting on the side of the Germans. But most of them, um, and among the captured is Yakov Dugashvili, Stalin's son from his first marriage. There he is. Yakov was offered uh, about a year later or six months later as an exchange for a, um, a general and Stalin refused and Yakov was executed by the Germans. Yakov had tremendous problems with his father. I don't have time today to go into all the things. At one point he tried to kill himself but didn't succeed. He had uh, joined as a tank commander. Uh, he left a wife and, and uh, children if I remember what happened, I think Stalin was down on, on his wife because she remarried. The guy was a Jewish guy and he had all this anti-Semitism and he never, it was, it was always a problem with that guy anyway. What's the difference? Okay, this is where the Germans sweep through the Crimea. And this is a scene of massacre and this is civilians coming to find their dead. It's just a horrible, uh, the reason I show you this picture is uh, this, the Germans had the potential of enlisting support. Ukrainians didn't like the Germans, uh, didn't like the Russians. Ukrainians had broken off during the uh, First World War to form their own country, and they might have gotten support among these people, but they were so heavy-handed, they were so rotten of themselves that they simply stimulated resistance. And resistance is the key to what happened next. Uh, fearing support from uh, people who he couldn't trust, Stalin instigated a deportation of nationalities. And these are different people who are uprooted from their homes, transported out, some north of the Arctic Circle, as you can see, practically into prison. They're just people. After all, they haven't done anything. And off they go. And you can see uh, the different uh, groups that were uh, um, taken out. Many died in the severe conditions of the resettlement. Horrible. But this is what the Germans ran into. Take a good look at this picture. This is a nurse, OK? This guy died, the guy that's there. Now, what this nurse is doing is she's picking up his gun. And she's going to fight. And that's what they ran into, this tremendous resistance. It's similar to what Napoleon found. And so they're bogging down. It's not a romp in the park. It's getting harder and harder and harder and harder until they come up to Moscow and they're damn exhausted. That is, the Germans are exhausted. OK? They get up there, there, there's the line, this is a picture of the line, and we're getting into December 1941. Now, I ask you, December 7th, 1941, which country suffered the most from the event of that day in the following months? following December 7th, 1941. Which country do you think suffered the most? Germany. Germany. And the reason Germany is because when that happened, Japan turned its armies and its armaments to the east, to the west, to the east, to the Americans. And they were no longer a threat along the Siberian border. And so Stalin took 
a million Siberian troops out of that theater, and now these exhausted Germans were faced with a million fresh Soviet troops in front of them, in front of Moscow. And the book that I sent around, Weinberg's book, Weinberg says, and I agree with him, that that's when Hitler lost the war. December 7th, 1941, was the point when Hitler lost the war. Because he never could get back the momentum, even though the next year we came up to Stalingrad, the, the Soviet recovery pushed back, and then we all know what happened next. I told you this would be unusual. <laughs> now look at this picture. This is 1941. This is not 1841. This is 1941. These guys, this is a cavalry charge. Could you imagine a cavalry charge that looks like this? Sabers in the air. This is unbelievable. These guys are charging over ice with their sabers. Of course, it must be terrifying to see them come, but I don't know how much of a military threat they really are, but who knows? The machine gun that much. Excuse me? Are they German or Russian? These are Russian. These are Russians. These are Russians. Outside of Moscow. OK, now, this is how they were supplied, all right? There are three routes for the Allies to get supplies in. Of course, they have their own manufacturing. They're manufacturing here, 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 and here. They're making armaments themselves. But we're sending in supplies. This is coming in over Norway, coming up from Great Britain, along the coast of Norway, around the, uh, the back of Norway to Murmansk. Very, very dangerous, because the Germans are out there with submarines. My mother's uncle was on this run, the Murmansk run. Very, very likely that you would get sunk if you were on a ship on this run. Another way to come in was up through the Indian Ocean in the uh, Middle East now, the famous Persian Gulf, through Iran and up through the Caspian Sea. And this was very, this was the best route for delivering supplies to the uh, Russians during the Second World War. And the Russians were, and the Germans were begging the Japanese to send their submarines around into the Indian Ocean and stop this flow, but the Japanese never would do it. And so this continued to go into Russia. And the third way to come in was out from the east. The Russians and the Japanese were not at war. So the Russians could send ships to the American West Coast pick up supplies and come across the Pacific and the Japanese would not touch them. They would bring the ships to Vladivostok, load the supplies on the Trans-Siberian Railroad and schlep them over to the uh, war front. It was a good route but not the best route. Okay, so now I want to show you a, a short film. This film has to do with the um, uh, issue of the second front. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off and we're going to uh, watch this film. Now these are actors acting the part of, um, okay, this is the Murmansk Run. The ships are going down, this is the Murmansk Run. It's very hard to get through. The Germans are bombing the ships. And now Churchill talks to Churchill talks to Stalin. These are actors. The British government refuses to continue the sending of war supplies to the Soviet Union. I must explain the dangerous and difficulty in convoy operations. In wartime, 
Okay, so we can get back. Okay, so what you saw there was the big three and the issue of the second front. And the actor, uh, you might have recognized who those actors were, but anyway, the actor was, um, was speaking for um, the Soviet Union. They're pressing for a second front, and they're looking for it in 1942. That's just a few months after um, the United States enters the war. Okay. This, now, uh, the the uh, these are the routes to get in. This is the route through uh, Persia. Um, these are the supply routes. And finally, in 1942, the second front's going to come up in a few minutes. But first, let's turn to 1942, the winter of 42-43. I told you I had a lot to say. I mean, I should be ending right now, but I have to go on to the end of the story. Okay, in 1942, they're at the gates of Stalingrad. They've pushed now. This is the second time, the second winter, and now the Germans are trying to finally win. They come into Stalingrad. They're fighting into the city of Stalingrad. The holdouts are here along the river. This is the Volga River. This little thing over here is the Tsaritsyn River, Tsaritsyn River. This town was once called Tsaritsyn. And this was the place that Stalin was sent by Lenin to gather grain. If you remember all the way back to my lecture on the Civil War, Stalin was sent down here to gather grain. And during that time, he put 100 white former uh, czarist officers who were working for the Reds on a barge and towed the barge out to the middle of the river with the intention of sinking it until the authorities in Moscow put an end to that and stopped him and pulled him back. So it was against Stalin being insubordinate. And it was his victory because of his power and so on. It was renamed to Stalingrad, the scene of his um, accomplishment in getting the grain for uh, Moscow. Today, this town is called Volgograd because all traces of Stalin are being eliminated. But anyway, we get back to Stalingrad. The Germans are pushing in, but at the same time that they're pushing into Stalingrad, the two Soviet armies, one from the south and one from the north, are closing a trap on this army Von Paulus's army of, of uh, over a half a million people. And Von Paulus sends 
uh, telegrams back to Hitler uh, asking for permission to withdraw, and he's refused because this is Stalingrad, because of its symbolic importance, Hitler wants this victory held. And in fact, it can't be held. The trap is closed, and these prisoners are taken, and that's the final end of the Russian, of the uh, uh, German uh, uh, fight in uh, Russia, and, and effectively the end of the war. This is a dramatic picture, the only thing left standing from a children's playground in Stalingrad, the tremendous devastation of Stalingrad. I recommend to any of you, if you have an interest in this, uh, to read about the Battle of Stalingrad. It's an unbelievable story and a great victory for the Soviet Union. And by the way, one of the generals, um, Rosakovsky, Rosakovsky was purged, he was in prison when the war broke out, and they took him out of prison to put him back into command, not for this battle, but in a, for earlier battles. It's a crazy country, I gotta say. Okay, now, now get this, now, the, now Stalingrad is over. He finds out that they're not gonna land, not in 1942, not in 1943, as he does in this movie, but in 1944. So what does he do? This is, this is the, uh, went, this is 42-43, uh, right? This is, the, this is after Stalingrad is the January of 43. He finds out there's not going to be a second front for another 12, 15 months. He contacts Sweden and he proposes to Hitler, let's go back to the beginning. We'll go back to 1914 and forget about the whole thing. Can you believe that that happened? That did happen, Weinberg, Weinberg says it happened, and Weinberg is the thoroughly researched historian. And Hitler doesn't want to give it up because Hitler's whole thing was the Ukraine. The stab in the back theory, the fact that they were starving in World War I, and this is his memory, and this is why he went into Russia in the first place. And, so, and, and also, how can he go back just like this after all the blood that spilled? And I ask you, do you think that Stalin was serious? That's why I showed you the second front picture, because this is turning the screws on Churchill and Roosevelt. Churchill was in the ministry during World War I. Roosevelt was under Secretary of Navy. And what went on in 1917? Russia pulled out of the war. And Germany no longer was fighting on two fronts in November in October 1917. So this threat that they were going to pull out must have rung, must have done knots with Churchill and Roosevelt. It must have been horrible for them to contemplate it. And that's why the character, the Roosevelt character, says to him, Winston, you have to be very careful about our, our ally. Fantastic stuff. Was it real or was it pressure? So what do you think? Pressure, don't you think so? It was, couldn't have been real. But maybe. We don't know. Now here they are, finally there. They, this is my favorite picture. I love this picture. There is the Germans. That's the German army officer sitting on a broken cannon, holding his head in his hands as the Russian front moves on toward his destruction. And here they are at uh, Yalta in, uh, uh, no, this is not Yalta, this is Tehran, 1943. In order to get to Tehran, this is Iran, right? In order to get there, Stalin has to fly. He's like my mother, he was afraid of flying. She never would fly in an airplane. He was very afraid to fly. He had two pilots. One pilot was a colonel, one pilot was a general. So he says, I want the colonel, because the colonel flies more than the general, more practice than the general. So I'll take the, and he, he had some bumps, you know, things that we've, we uh, don't even mind nowadays, but he would never fly after that. Okay, now, 1944, Roosevelt is running for the fourth term. He can't obtain a facsimile, not this printed out, but a handwritten facsimile with Stalin's okay on the bottom of it. And he says to Stalin, let's divide up Europe now. 
And these are the percentages, this famous percentage agreement. Churchill publishes it in his memoirs. And if you look at what was done here, it's actually what was done. In a way, Stalin lives up to it except for Poland, which is 50-50. I don't have it on my store, but the rest of it is there. Romania was Soviet dominated. Greece was English dominated. Yugoslavia was 50-50. Tito was in charge. Hungary 50-50, but it went the other way. And Bulgaria pretty much went to Russia. Here they are at Yalta. And this is the advance of the Red Army, as you see, all the way up through Poland in 1944. And now, this is another picture that I like. There's the Red Army walking on the, on the Nazi flag on their way into Berlin as the city burns. And now, the opposite of the other picture. These are German prisoners being marched down the streets of Moscow. So the world churn, turns. And now Potsdam. Interesting thing about this picture, as we know, Truman was not the tallest guy in the world, nor was uh, Churchill. But Stalin is even shorter than the other two. Now another thing to remember. At this meeting, Truman tells Stalin that we have the atomic bomb. But don't you know, Stalin was well aware that we had the atomic bomb. He had spies that told him about it. So what do you think was going through Stalin's mind when he learns from his so-called ally after all this time that they've worked on and developed an atomic bomb? This suspicious man, Stalin, you can be sure that when the war is over, as we are sure, that the Cold War would commence. This was not a guy to cooperate with the West the way we would have liked him to. But look at them here, how happy they are, of course, with good reason. Oh, I got to the end of it in time. I thank you all very much. Anybody have any questions? I know I, I gave you a lot, but that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you turn the lights up? Yeah. And there, there was actually in Siberia a Jewish autonomous state. Yes, that was before that. That was, uh, does somebody remember Bor uh, what the name of that place was? It was all the way out. Uh, no, it wasn't because of that. It was an answer to the old cry that we wanted autonomy, going all the way back to 1908. Any other questions? Uh, I just comment that uh, uh, really the, uh, the German army was incredible. You know, in yeah. Time, and they had sort of streamlined their blitzkrieg in Poland. Yeah. And, and not just the idea of the Ardennes, it was so far as, but this was, France was prepared for a, a, a trench warfare, right. a Maginot Line, a right. defensive. And the Blitzkrieg just zipped through. That's right. Outflanked them. Right. And, and then with Russia, it was a question of supply lines. Right. And, and it was a holding action until the second fight. Right. But you, they got exhausted by the time they got to Moscow. So why do you think Hitler declared war on this? On the US. Okay, that's right. Why did Hitler, that was a good question. I, I went through that very quickly. Hitler wanted desperately the Japanese to fight the Russians. That would have been his savior. And so he declared war on the United States because he wanted the Japanese to feel that he was with them, that he was going to be their friend, and that they should come into the war against the uh, Russians. And he could not get them to do that. And that's why he declared war on the United States. It didn't cost him a lot in his mind to declare war on the United States, because the United States could not come in. As you see, as you know yourself, until 1944 could appear. That whole Italian campaign, I hate to say this, because some of you may have some people and you may know about, was a waste of time, a waste of, of people's lives. The only reason that we had that damn thing was to keep Stalin happy that we had a semi-second front. It didn't do nothing, as we used to say in Brooklyn, for anybody. 
It was a fight. There was some troops held there, but the bulk of Hitler's troops were in the Soviet Union, and the thing that we really needed was a war in France to draw them away. Of course, by 1944, when we landed in France, which we're all very proud of, and we're all happy that we had it, basically, what it achieved was not the defeat of Germany. It prevented the Soviet Union from dominating Western Europe. If you want to know what, what D-Day really did, it wasn't the defeat of Germany. It was to stop the Soviet Union, because if we hadn't done that, they would have swept right up to the English Channel. Think about it. Why do you have any speculation about why the Japanese would not take on the Soviet Well, for the Japanese, there was much more. There was not. First of all, they got bloody. These fights along the border, the one that I showed you about, they were they were costly, and they had a lot of respect for the Soviet Union, and there wasn't enough in it for them. What was more in it for them was Indonesia, was the Philippines, were uh, domination of China, was going even into Burma and India. There was where the riches were, as far as that they were concerned. Oil, oil if they, yeah, then they needed oil, they still do. Yeah. I just curiously, you did, I was reading a book here where talking about Wolken and strategies that were presented yeah. to Hitler after yeah. the fall of France in terms of what they should be doing uh, as a means of getting England out of the war so they would have a free hand elsewhere. Uh, it was not the invasion of England since he pretty much made up his mind early in the game. That wasn't going to happen. But, but the idea was for them to adopt the Mediterranean strategy, which was to, through Spain, take over to Yeah. So, you know, so yeah. as for the Italy and control the Mediterranean and come up. And yeah, the Africa Corps, right, the Africa Corps. Yeah, it was. It's an interesting, it's a different picture than we normally keep about what the war was all about.